Repentance and Confession by St. Nectarius Part 1. Repentance 1. Concerning Repentance According to St. John of Damascus, repentance is a return from the unnatural to the natural state and from the devil to God through ascesis and toil. Moreover, it is a voluntary return from transgressions towards the opposite virtues. The signs of repentance are remorse and a change of mind, while characteristics of repentance include contrition of the heart, tears, the rejection of sin, and the love for virtue. Repentance must, of necessity, be sincere. It is sincere when accompanied by contrition of the heart, by the disposition to compensate divine righteousness and to confess one's sins. True repentance is a change of mind for one's actions, an alteration of one's ethical life, a change toward the better, complete rejection of one's previous life and sin, steadfast willingness to exercise virtue, complete unification of one's own will with the divine will, i.e. the divine law. Therefore, repentance is an ethical rebirth of man and the starting point of a new, virtuous life. A model for true repentance is given to us by the prophet Isaiah, who incites the Jews to repent and return to God. This is what he says, Wash you, be clean, remove your iniquities from your souls before mine eyes, cease from your iniquities, learn to do well, diligently seek judgment, deliver him that is suffering wrong, plead for the orphan, and obtain justice for the widow. And come, let us reason together, says the Lord. And though your sins be as purple, I will make them white as snow. And though they be as scarlet, I will make them white as wool. Isaiah chapter 1. He who truly repents has a broken and humbled heart. David, the prophet and king, is a true example of repentance. His mind and heart, soul and body, both the inner and outer man, bears witness to his true change of mind and his burning desire to appropriate God. His psalms, full of divine fervor, especially the psalm of repentance, through which he seeks the mercy of the Lord, are translucent mirrors in which his heavenly zeal and the exalted character of true repentance are reflected. This type of broken and humbled heart God will not despise. Similar examples are also the repentance of Manasseh, the king of Judah, the Ninevites, the publican, and that of the prodigal son. The repentance of Zacchaeus simultaneously indicates both the manner in which the cure of sin takes place and the manner in which the offended divine righteousness is compensated. Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. The myrrh of the repentant harlot, the tears of Peter, and the repentance of the thief are the most expressive examples of true repentance and concurrently of God's love toward man. False repentance is that exhibited by the Pharaoh, who confessed his own sin ten times, asked for forgiveness ten times, received forgiveness ten times, enraged God ten times, and finally marched out against God's will. His foolish heart was not humbled by his sins, but remained hard and unyielding. His repentance was repentance due to fear, not repentance with feeling, not with consciousness of his sin. He repented out of fear of being punished or killed, and not from the feeling that he sinned against God, not from the realization of his great sin. This is why he was submerged within the depths of the Red Sea, suffering rightly for his false repentance. 2. We are obliged to hasten toward repentance. Our concern for salvation must be without delay due to the impending danger to our soul's salvation. He who is unconcerned about the salvation of his soul is at risk of twofold danger. He may either be unexpectedly snatched by death or abandoned by the grace of God. In both cases, the harm is immense because the outcome is the death of his soul. 
This is why St. John Chrysostom instructs us by saying, Do not delay returning to the Lord, nor wait from one day to the next, lest you are crushed as you wait. The time of death is unknown, and it is unknown for this reason, so that you may always be vigilant. This is why the day of the Lord comes in the same manner as a thief in the night, not to steal, but to make us more secure. For he who foresees the thief lives with vigilance, and having lit a lantern is always awake. And so similarly, you also having lit the light of the faith and the proper way of life, hold on to the candles cheerfully in continual wakefulness. Since we do not know when the bridegroom comes, it is necessary to be prepared always, so that when he comes he may find us vigilant. St. Gregory the theologian also says, It is not necessary to wait for a specific time to correct yourself, because you know nothing for certain about tomorrow. Many, having planned many things, did not make it to tomorrow. If you are continually passing over today while waiting for tomorrow, by your little procrastinations you will be robbed by the evil one, as his manner is. Give me, he says, the present, and to God the future. Give me your youth, and to God old age. Give me pleasures, and to him uselessness. How great is the danger that surrounds you! How many are the unexpected misfortunes! War has expended you, or a crumb has gone the wrong way, a most insignificant thing, but what is easier than for a man to die? even though you think so highly of yourself. Or a too freely indulged drinking bout, or a wind knocked you down, or a horse ran away with you, or a drug maliciously schemed against you, or was found to be deleterious when meant to be beneficial. The grace of God abandons the unrepentant person because this person has disregarded the wealth of God's kindness, tolerance, and forbearance. Behold what the Apostle Paul says to the person who persists in sin. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them who do such things, and does the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. Divine forbearance is transformed into indignation, tolerance into intolerance, and goodness into repulsion. This is why the chief of the apostles also advises us not to be deceived. We should not regard God's tolerance and forbearance as slowness, because he is not slow but forbears, not wishing any of us to perish, but for all to come to repentance. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. Warning that we are obliged to hasten to seek the Lord, the Lord himself declares, You shall seek me and shall not find me. Therefore, as long as grace invites us, we are obligated to approach continually. Perhaps when we seek grace we will not find her, because the door will have been shut, and as we cry out, open, open up for us, the bridegroom will respond to us, I know you not. We have lived in sin, perhaps we will die in it. Who can verify for us the opposite, since we remain unrepentant? Behold what the Lord says to the Jews, I go my way, and you shall seek me, you shall die in your sin. If therefore we do not repent while we have Christ calling us to him, we will die in our sin, we will seek him, but our search will end in vain. Hence it is necessary to understand well that we are obligated to hasten toward repentance, both because the grace of God may abandon us, and because often the sins themselves spring forth untimely and sudden deaths. As the Apostle Paul states in his epistle to the sinning Corinthians, 
For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. An example of the abandonment by God witnessed in scriptures is Zedekiah, king of Judah, who was abandoned by God and handed over to destruction along with his kingdom. Even though he sought the Lord's mercy through the prophet Jeremiah and beseeched the prophet by saying, Pray to God on our behalf. However, Jeremiah received a commandment from God not to pray for them, because he handed over the city and king Zedekiah into the hands of the fearsome tyrant Nebuchadnezzar, king of the Babylonians. Hence, Jeremiah did not pray for them. The city was conquered, sacked, everyone from young to old died by the sword. All of Zedekiah's family was slaughtered before his eyes. Then they plucked out his eyes, tied him in chains, and led him captive to Babylon. God poured out his anger and rage on Zedekiah and the city because they mocked and disregarded the words of the prophet Jeremiah, and they hardened their hearts from turning to the Lord. Truly, it is frightening, but also just. It is just for him who abandons God to be abandoned by him. It is just for him who pushes away the inviting grace of God to be pushed away. It is just for God to turn his face away from them who desert him and who do not approach him. St. Gregory of Nyssa notes, In this manner God's righteous judgment resembles our dispositions. Whatever we have within us, such things justice remits to us from our own things. Our haste to return and repent quickly is also dictated by the danger of inability to return to God. An evil habit is capable of rendering us incapable of repentance, which should frighten us immensely. The habit resulting from the continual repetition of a sin becomes a natural state within man and renders itself so powerful that man is no longer able to resist it. Its power has overcome even the natural law. Consequently, when habit reigns over us, we submit to it and become its slave. Free will has lost its independence permanently. Man expels his free volition. His willpower is proven weak and unable to fight against the habit, and every attempt to regain the lost freedom is in vain. The battle makes this weakness more apparent. The person who has been conquered by habit carries out, acts, and executes as a servant, as a subordinate. Self-will has ceased. He carries out orders as instructed. The voice of the inner man is drowned within his sternum. The habit becomes very torturous, because even though the strength of the passions has dissipated, the habit insists on being remedied by them. Such is habit, such is its power, such is its tyranny. When it rules over us once, then it controls our desires. It regulates our actions, and the reins with which it controls our dispositions never parts from its hands. Then everything has been lost, every hope of salvation has vanished, not even one ray of light has remained. Has someone lived in sin? He will also die in sin. Therefore it is necessary for us to hasten to repentance before be sin becomes a habit for us, because then it is impossible for us to be saved. Footnote. Lest someone thinks that St. Nectarios is preaching the Calvinist predestination falsehood, we explain, Calvinists falsely believe that man is predestined to hell or heaven by God. Hence, good works are irrelevant for salvation. All one needs is to have faith in Christ. Although St. Nectarios uses terms such as never, impossible, free will has lost its independence forever, they are not to be understood in the Protestant sense. St. Nectarios is hyperbolizing in order to stress the reality of habit and sin. This is done in scripture often. For example, Christ says, And I... If I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. And St. John the Beloved says, And there are many other things which Jesus did, which, if they should be written out, every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain all the books that should be written. Obviously, not every single person has believed in Christ, and the earth could contain all the books written about Christ's works. But Christ says all to mean many. And the Beloved to emphasize the vastness and grandeur of Christ's works. Similarly, St. Nectarios is warning of a reality of experience. The following story from St. Dorotheos captures the spirit of St. Nectarios' words. A certain great elder with, was with his disciples in a place where there were cypresses, some small and some large. 
The elder said to one of his disciples, Uproot the cypress tree. It was a very small tree, and the brother uprooted it with just one hand. The elder then pointed out another one, a larger one than the first, and said to him, Cut this one down as well. He managed to move it with both hands, and he rooted it out. Again the elder showed him another, still larger. He uprooted this one as well, but with more difficulty. He saw another larger one. The brother shook it many times, toiled and sweated, and he managed to uproot this one as, as well. The elder showed him a very large one, and in spite of the fact that he toiled and sweated a great deal, he could not uproot it. When the elder saw that he could not do it, not having enough strength, he asked another brother to get up and help him, and thus the two of them uprooted it. The elder said to his brothers, It is the same with the passions, brethren. While they are young, we can easily uproot them if we so desire. But if we neglect them as insignificant, they harden, and as they do so, they cause greater pain. If they become rooted in us, then we cannot dig them out, even with great effort, unless we have the aid of certain saints who will help us after God. 3. The habit to sin brings death. We should be unyielding towards sin, because if it steals our consent even once, it becomes our true master. A suitable example which exposes the deceitful and tyrannical character of sin is the method with which Semiramis seized the kingdom and became an empress. Semiramis succeeded through various affectionate gestures to persuade her husband Nino, king of Assyria, to step down from his reign for just one day and to hand over to her the scepter of the kingdom. But what was the empress's first action? She commanded to her hus that her husband Nino be executed in order to secure for herself lifelong power. The depiction is complete, applicable in all aspects. Sin, as Semiramis, struggles through various methods to gain a person's consent. As soon as it accomplishes this desire, it conquers man. It captures and kills logic. It erects its throne upon man's heart and remains in control for the remainder of his life. Such is sin, such are its characteristics. Therefore, let us never give in to its tactics. Let us not deliver to it the authority over our heart. Let us not carry out what the inner man does not desire. Let us not submit our free will to the will of sin. Let us not consent to whatever is contrary to the moral law. Let nothing soften our heart. May the most caressing words prove our heart to be tougher than steel. May the tears, sighs, promises, and threats make no impression on us. Let us stand firm and unshakable in our mindset, so that we do not, after a short period, wet our dismal cheeks with tears of fruitless, unproductive regret. The cowardly retreat will convey a twofold evil to us. First, shame, and second, misfortune. Conversely, courageous resistance to evil will impart boldness, glory, and bliss. Holy Scripture indicates most suitable examples of this. Amongst the men, the all-comely Joseph, who chose every type of hardship and even death itself in order to keep his moral ideals, in order to preserve his ethical freedom, in order to keep the law of God. Amongst the women, the virtuous Susanna, who chose death over sin. If Nino had remained unyielding to Semiramis' caress, she would have remained in lifelong submission to him. Steadfastness, therefore, and courage. Only through these will we maintain the sovereignty of our mind and our ethical freedom. Nino's example teaches us that we must not only fear the powerful habit, but that to sin even once is dangerous and dreadful. Therefore, it is necessary to flee from sin with all of our strength. However, if we have sinned, let us repent as quickly as possible, so that we do not become enslaved to it. St. Basil the Great says, If it is terrible to sin, how much worse is it to persist in sins? The divine Chrysostom also states, It is not terrible to fall, but having fallen, to remain lying down and not rise up, to conceal the weakness of one's dispositions with thoughts of despair, while remaining inert and purposely neglecting one's obligations. And again, to sin is perhaps human, but to persist in sin, this then is not human, but totally satanic. 4. 
Concerning True Repentance and Its Fruit The wise Didymus says that true repentance makes the mind of the person who repents clean. St. Nilo states that good repentance is tremendously powerful for salvation, which we should continually cultivate in order for us to be saved and not perish. Because when you return and sigh, says the prophet Isaiah, then you will be saved. For godly sorrow works repentance to salvation not to be repented of. Romans 7.10 No one ever perished having used the effective medicine of repentance. St. John Chrysostom declares, Repentance is the cause of the kingdom of heaven, the entrance to paradise, and the enjoyment of eternal delight. The person who repents for the evil that he has committed, even if he does not show repentance worthy of his sins, nevertheless he will receive recompense for this repentance. Clement of Alexandria says, True repentance is to be found guilty no longer of the same things, but to uproot them all together from the soul. And again, to repent truly is to cease from sin and to look back no longer. And elsewhere, it is good not to sin, but it is also good for the sinful to repent. Just as it is excellent to be healthy always, it is also good to recover after an illness. St. Basil the Great advises, neither despair nor cease from praying, but approach even though you are sinful, so that you may glorify the Master and give him the opportunity to show his loving kindness when your sins are forgiven. Likewise, if you fear to approach, you have prevented his goodness and impeded his abundant kindness. And again, have we been harmed through sins? Let us be healed with repentance. However, repentance without fasting is futile. 5. Concerning the Invitation to Sinners by God, the Lover of Mankind Through all of the prophets, God has invited all those who have sinned to repentance. Through the prophet Malachi, he summons them thus, Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. Through the prophet Jeremiah, he admonishes, Return ye now, every one, from his evil way, and make your ways and your doings good. And through the prophet Isaiah, he affirms, I am God, and there is not another beside me, a just God and a Savior. There is none but me. Turn ye to me, and you shall be saved, ye that come from the end of the earth. God summons us to repentance through the prophet Joel, saying, Turn to me with all your heart and with fasting, and with weeping, and with lamentation, and rend your hearts, and not your garments, and turn to the Lord your God, for he is merciful and compassionate, long-suffering, and plenteous in mercy, and repents of evils. Through the prophet Zechariah, God invites the sinner, saying, Turn to me, and I will turn to you, says the Lord Almighty. Through the prophet Ezekiel, he declares, For I desire not the death of him that dies, be converted, and turn from all your ungodliness. For why should ye die, O house of Israel? The forerunner was the herald of repentance. The Savior himself came preaching repentance and forgiveness of sins. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The divine Chrysostom, interpreting this verse, says, Come, not some person, but everyone who has worries, who has sorrows, who has sins. Come, not so that I may demand accountability, but so that I may loosen your sins. Come, not because I am in need of your praise, but because I desire your salvation, for I will give you rest. He did not say, I will save only, but even much more, so that I may make everyone secure. Moreover, in order to show the profound loving kindness of God toward mankind, and so that he may render the sinners more fervent toward repentance, he reveals to them the mysteries of heaven. Joy, he says, shall be in heaven over one sinner that repents, more than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. God does not immediately go after those who sin, but he grants time for repentance and for the healing and rectification of the mistake, says St. Nielos. The preaching of the apostles had as its purpose that repentance may be preached to all the nations, starting from Jerusalem, 
Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem.